But I want to talk to you about letting God fight your battles this morning. We're going to take a, a look at chapter 10, and really it gives us kind of a 10,000-foot a 10, overview of some of the, the, the themes that you see in chapters 10 through 12 as God moves his people. In the past few weeks, we have seen how God moved the people in victory, and he took down Jericho, and he took down Ai for the people, and even brought the people of Gibeon uh, into uh, surrender to the people of Israel. And all of, those, all of those peoples were in the center of the promised land. In Joshua chapter 10 through 12, we see how Joshua, moved by the Holy Spirit, recorded for us the victories that God brought in the next two military campaigns, one in the south and then one in the north, as God fought for his people to bring the promised land to them. You know, I, I heard a story about a grandfather that went to visit some grandkids of his, and they were in the backyard playing, and he decided that he'd go out on the back porch and rock in the rocker and watch his kids play. And he's out there, and they're having a great time, and so he interjects, and he says, Hey, kids, what are y'all playing? And he said, and the, one of the boys said, well, Grandpa, we're playing war. And he said, really? I don't hear any fighting. And one of the grandkids said, well, that's because we're all generals, Grandpa. <laughs> well, as we look at this passage today, I want to I remind you, as the Holy Spirit reminded me, that as Christians, we're not playing war. We are in a spiritual battle. And we are all in this fight. As we look at Joshua chapter 10, in the ver first 15 verses or so, we see some spiritual truths that we need to apply to our hearts and our lives if we're going to win in these spiritual battles that we fight. And listen, it's every day. Whether you like it or not, we are in a fight every day for our spiritual growth and our becoming more and more like Jesus, what we call sanctification. And really... In these battles that Joshua goes through in the Old Testament, they provide a New Testament illustration for us of what it looks like to grow in our faith in Jesus. And today I want to share with you just a few principles from God's Word about how you can walk in victory and as you let God fight your battles for you. If you're there with me, would you read these first five verses here, and we're going to walk through this passage as has been our, our uh, approach the last several weeks. But look at these first five verses with me. As soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, now I got the last part right, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, verse 2, he feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than I, and all its men were warriors. So the king of Jerusalem sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, and Piram, king of Jarmuth. Next week we're going to have one of the deacons do our reading for us. Amen. Jarmuth. To Japhia, king of Lachish, and to Debir, king of Eglon. Now that's five of them. Thankfully, we get a little commentary here in a few verses. That's five kings. He called on them, and he, verse 4, he said, Come up to me and help me, and let, let us strike Gibeon. For it made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. Verse 5, Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered their forces and went up with all their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. Father in heaven, we do ask that you would continue to manifest your presence here with us today. God, we need your word in our hearts and in our lives. God, we would pray that we would not just hear the words of men, but that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts to help us. Lord, only you know all the battles that are represented here that we're facing in our individual lives and as we seek to live close to you. And so, God, would you, would you speak to our hearts? 
through the power of your word today. God, lead us to greater trust in you, especially those who are here that may not know Jesus as their Savior. Would you lead them to the ultimate victory today of salvation? And we ask it in his name. Amen. The first truth that we see in this passage, if we're going to let God fight our battles here in the first five verses, is that we cannot afford to fall for intimidation. So we look at at these first five verses. Here the people of Gibeon are, and they have made a treaty in alliance with the people of Israel. We read that in the previous chapter last week, if you weren't here with us. Uh, If you need a refresher, you can go look at that there in chapter 9. But as the kings around hear what God is up to, they stand up to oppose the movement of God as God seeks to come through on his promises to his people. And I'm glad that he does without fail when we trust him. Amen? But there's something that you need to know. As we see Israel tied up in this with them, We are reminded that living the Christian life is a day in and day out spiritual battle. And I want to remind you, in case you have forgotten or in case you didn't know, sanctification and growing in godliness, growing to be close to Jesus is not easy. It's a fight. It's a fight every day. And these verses give us a picture of how the enemy fights against our growth in Christ. Listen, up to this point, Israel has been on the offense. They've been in the driver's seat following God's leadership, and they have won victory after victory following God and His Spirit. But now, listen, just like the devil does in our own life, when we are moving in victory, growing in godliness, walking in obedience in our lives, and our hearts are being transformed little by little to look more like Jesus. Listen, at some point the enemy is going to stand up and he's going to say, that's enough, and you can know that you're going to fight, face a fight from the enemy because he does not want you to experience the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in your life. He wants to keep you from walking in the promises of God, uh, of His power in your heart to bring change to your life of those issues that you struggle with so bad. And more than that, He wants to stop your witness. And He's going to do all that He can. But Israel had begun walking in the abundant life that God called them to. And in the next couple of chapters, we see how God brought this victory to them. And they were moving in victory. But now the heat was up as they, in their sanctification as they walked to seek to walk in the fullness of God's promises for their lives. And these five kings stood up against them and stood up against God. And it is a picture of the fight that we face. And I want to tell you, believer, in case you don't know, one of Satan's biggest strategies to keep you from walking in victory is to convince you that you are in a fight that you can't win. These five kings stand up before they had faced one-on-one, but now Satan switched his tactics, and now he sought to intimidate the people of God by bringing five kings at once. You know the kings that we so often face in our life is facing these things, these areas, these behaviors, these attitudes, different realms of our life that need to be brought into submission to God and his word that need to be transformed. But then when we face them, we feel like, man, I've been fighting this battle a long time. It's too late for change. It's too big. It's too powerful. It's too embarrassing. My struggle, nobody else gets what I'm going through. My struggle is so unique, there's no help for me. If we were being honest, at some point we could each identify with different parts of those feelings. And you have to understand, believer, that that is a lie from Satan. Trying to keep you from experiencing the power of God to bring transformation into your life. And if we're going to win, we have to choose to trust in God and put our faith in his promises instead of being fixated on the size of our problems. You said that 
I want to show you here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Mark, make that, mark that down in the margin of your Bible this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 speaks God's truth into our spiritual battles. And God's word tells us that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Your whatever battle that you are facing, it is not so unique that God can't help you win. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And God is faithful. Y'all, my knee's starting to recover, and I almost want to jump up and down, but my boy took care of that this morning for us on the stage. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God has promised to us victory if we will listen to him and walk according to his word. And instead of walking in doubt and fear to trust in faith and to take the next step of faith to say, God, I know that this is real and it is challenging and it's bigger than me, but it's nothing compared to you. And I'm going to trust in you. I have to admit that I turned my radio off about 10 years ago, and that's not a moral thing or anything like that. I just enjoy the solitude, okay? But last time I turned on the radio, there was a song by Casting Crowns out. It was contemporary at one time. By now, it's dated. Amen? And they wrote a song called The Voice of Truth. And in that, he talks about the battles that we go through about how he wants, to, he wants to have the faith to step out of the boat like Peter did and to walk on the waves. But they keep laughing at him, telling him he can't do it. How he, how he wished that he had the faith to be able to stand up to a giant in his life, a spiritual giant in his life, with just a, slo- a, a stone and a sling. But the giant keeps calling me, calling out my name, telling me, boy, you'll never win. But I love the chorus. And it says, but the voice of truth tells me a different story. And the voice of truth says, do not be afraid. And the voice of truth says, this is for my glory. Out of all the voices calling out to me, I will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth. Some of us have been listening to the enemy's lies for far too long, being robbed of the victory that God wants to bring to us. And if we're going to walk in victory, we've got to begin moving in faith and trusting in the promises and the power of his word. And we can do that when we decide that there's only one king. The people of Israel, we see in the next few verses, we read how the Gibeonites call on them because they're in a covenant relationship with them. And Israel comes to them without delay. Even though there are five kings opposing them, Israel comes because they know, now watch this, they know that there's only one true king. And no matter how big the, their armies are that they face, they know that they are nothing compared to to the army of heaven and the one that sits on the throne as the king of Israel, the king over their life, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and they are going to put their trust in him. They have seen him deliver them time and time again. They have learned some hard lessons along the way, but now they are ready to meet the day and to meet it with faith in God as their king. And so they come out to this moment knowing that God is their king, and they've made a covenant in his name, and they're going to stand by that commitment to to help bring these Gibeonites to, to victory with them because it didn't matter how many pretend kings presented themselves. If Israel honored God, then God would honor them and have their back. The New Testament tells us this way. In the book of Romans in chapter 8, it tells us that if God is for us, then who could be against us? 
I heard a preacher say it this way years ago, and I've used this. That's this, okay. It's got a lot of mileage left in it. Amen. He said uh, his interpretation of that was, if God is for us, then who cares who's against us? Amen. Who cares who's against us? Listen, let me tell you another way that I heard a preacher put it. In your spiritual battles, it doesn't matter where they come from, how big they are, what the, what the struggle is. What matters is remembering who God is in your life and that He can bring you through and He can bring you in to victory. And you can't fall for intimidation when you remember who God is. Now look at these next few verses with me. And I want to tell you that the, that the next important truth that you must put in your life if you want to see God fight your battles for you is you can't fight from isolation. You can't fight in isolation. Look at verse 6 with me. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal saying, Do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us for the king of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. Verse 8, And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night, all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon and struck them as far as Azekah and Mekedah. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There, are, there were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Friend, if you're going to see the victory that God wants to bring to you, you can't afford to fight in isolation. In chapter 9, again, the, the people of Gibeon, they had come. Uh, under uh, under a guise, under they they had come under uh, under a mask, parading that they were from a far distant land, because they had heard about how God had brought down Jericho and how God had brought down I, and they didn't want to be the next ones on the list. So they come and they bring moldy bread and they they dis they trick Israel. And Israel didn't do enough reference checking, enough background investigation, amen. And, but God permitted them to come into this covenant relationship because Israel, now watch this, this is important, Israel was intended to be God, uh, a light unto the nations and Israel in many ways was showing them God's mercy by uh, God allowing them to be permitted to be brought into covenant relationship with the people of Israel. In many ways, just a side note of, of, of some theology, this, uh, this passage forecasts to us and foreshadows for us the way that God would allow all people to be brought into covenant relationship through his son, Jesus, as he would bring him through Israel. Now, I'm through uh, on the theology. Now, backtrack with me into this passage here. And I want you to see something else in this passage, though. As the people of Gibeon called out to Israel, they called out on them, and watch this, because they were in a covenant together. That is, they were bound together. That meant that if the people at Israel understood that if the people at Gibeon suffered, so would Israel. And even though they were from different backgrounds and had different struggles, they were in a common bond through covenant relationship that they belong to, you might say that they belonged to a body together through covenant relationship. In case you don't see the parallel, let me put it this way, that God in the New Testament, through each of our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that he has made all people who believe on his son Jesus a part of a covenant body. 
And we ought to learn something from the people of Gibeah. That God did not create us to walk in our battles alone. That God created us to need a body of believers to help us in our fight. Listen, God did not save you to just leave you out there to figure it out on your own. When you got saved and you trusted in his word, God intends for us to be part of a body of believers who are there to help us, there to intercede for us, there to come along and pick us up, there to come along in our time of need to help us walk in faithfulness to Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 this way, that we are to bear one another's burdens and therefore to so fulfill the law of Christ that we are to come alongside each other. And as we do, where we are weak and we come and we provide strength to help each other walk, we display the gospel to each other just as Jesus left heaven when we were weak and we couldn't fight for salvation for ourselves, but he came and he won the battle for us that as brothers and sisters in Christ, when we come along each aside each other, we remind each other of the gospel and we display it to each other. And we model it to the community that is around us watching the way that believers interact with each other. As we see God's love manifest in, in us as we help each other. And if we're going to walk in victory, we've got to stop stiff-arming God's means of help in our lives. God gave us a family of believers to help us. The story is told of Muhammad Ali, the one-time world heavyweight champion in boxing, floated like a butterfly, stung like a bee. You know who I'm talking about. He was on an airplane, and the stewardess came by, and she found out that Mr. Ali wasn't wearing a seatbelt. It had gone over the intercom that everybody needed to put on their seatbelt so the flight could take off, and the stewardess comes by and says, Mr. Ali, you have got to put on your seatbelt. And he said, Sweetheart, I'm Superman, and Superman don't need no seatbelt. And that stewardess looked at him, and she said, Yeah, you know another thing Superman don't need? A plane. (laughs) Well, I'm going to tell you this morning, believer, sometimes we need to be reminded that God did not create us to be Superman. It's okay to be weak. And when we come to the place where we are weak and in humility come to a brother or a sister (laughs) with some wisdom, amen? And we say, I need somebody to pray for me. I need help. I need somebody to come alongside me. Listen, they can be Jesus' hands and feet to help you to overcome. I love verse 9. Verse 9 tells us that as they came out, as they cried out, that Joshua dropped everything and he marched all night. He marched all night to get to the problem to help. I want to tell you, believers, some of us need to get a Joshua in our lives. Somebody that you can call when the fight is on and that they'll, come, they'll drop everything to get to where you are, to rally to your support, to lift you up, to be God's strength to, when all your strength is gone, to minister God's strength to you. But I want to tell you something else. Before you ask God to bring a Joshua into your life, you need to tell God you're ready to be a Joshua in somebody else's life. Say, God, I, I believe and I understand that we are not created to walk alone. And I'm ready to help. I'm not perfect, but I can bring them to you and I can lift them up in prayer. And I'm ready to come alongside my brother and sister. And I'm ready to stop pretending like we can make it on our own. That we need each other. You know, when I was a kid, uh, my dad would have a project going out in the front yard, uh, working on one of our our hoopties. Amen. I'm not sure. I didn't check if it was okay to use that terminology here this morning. We'll just uh, blame it on the Holy Spirit. Amen. (laughs) One of my cars that wasn't functioning so well. 
And we, we'd be out there, and Dad would have me trying to loosen some bolts, and he'd have a, a wrench out there, and I'd be trying, giving it everything I could. And I, man, I'd just end up frustrated because it never would break loose. And so Dad comes over, and you know what he does. Some of you men know he brought me another wrench, and he connected the ends of them together, and he, gave, he showed me what you call a cheetah bar to bring some leverage to the situation. And you know what? I've been using that ever since. Amen. It's not because I'm weak. I, I, I am, but it's not the reason why. The reason why I use it is because I realized how much wiser my father is than I am. And I got tired of walking in frustration. And you know what? What, what happens when we put to practice what God is telling us in his word right here and we find a Joshua to help us? You know what? He can be the cheetah bar in our life that brings through a breakthrough in our walk with God. And if we want to walk through, we, we need to find a Joshua and stop fighting in isolation. Here's the last truth that I want to share with you this morning. If you hear anything else, don't forget the power of intercession. Don't forget the power of intercession. Look at these last few verses with me. Verses 12 through 15. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in that in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, praying to God, he said, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ahijalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. A whole day the sun stood still. Verse 14, there has not been a day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of man for the Lord fought for Israel. The Lord fought for Israel. Perhaps the most important truth that the Holy Spirit shows us in this passage this morning is how powerful prayer can be when God's people put it to practice. God wants us to return to the power of prayer because we cannot win our spiritual battles through human strategies or by our own strength. Verse 10 reminds us how God fought for his people and as they were obedient now listen, they had learned some hard lessons. Just the other day in their walk, they had tried to fight on their own and got run out of town. And then they didn't seek God in prayer. And then they ended up with some Gibeonite baggage. Amen? But this time, when Joshua comes to the battle scene, he knows that I need to go to God in prayer. Even, now watch this. Even though God had already promised them that he had given them victory, Joshua said, hold up, I'm going to put the brakes on and we're going to spend some time in prayer to show our dependence on God. And when they did, God brought the victory. God wants his people to come back to a place of dependence and prayer. And when we come to God in prayer to tap into the power of intercession, what we're telling God is that we are giving our battle over to him because we know that even our very best battle plans could never lead us to the level of spiritual victory that God wants to bring to us. Can I tell you something? God could have been gracious and brought the victory to the people of Israel that day. But if they wouldn't have stopped and prayed, they would have never seen the miracle that God did when he made the sun stand still. God wants to do greater than we could have ever asked or imagined according to the book of Ephesians. If his people will call on him in prayer. One of the movies that came out recently you're familiar with, a movie called War Room. Any of y'all have seen it? This movie uh, takes uh, Priscilla Stryer, the daughter of Tony Evans. She's one of the main characters in the movie, and her and her husband, they're having problems in their home. Their marriage is about to fall apart. She sells houses, she's in realty, and she ends up finding this little old lady, and they start a Bible study together. 
And she begins to relay how she's all the time at odds with her husband and nothing goes right in their relationship. And so the lady that's a prayer warrior, she takes her and she tells her about how she too had fought her battles in her own strength. That way relays how her and her husband had had that similar kind of relationship. But then God brought her to the end of herself. And the little old lady takes Priscilla Schreier up the staircase to her prayer closet where she has a list of all the prayers that God has answered since that day when she decided to fight God's way. I know that the story is fictional, but I want you to don't miss this. It draws on a truth straight from God's word. When we get ready to stop fighting out of our pride, when we humble our hearts before God, and when we come to him in broken, desperate prayer, he will, he will fight for us. He will fight for us, and he will bring victory to us over situations that we've gave up on long ago, things we've lost hope in, things that we thought could never change. God can change when his people pray, when his people pray. He calls us to prayer. Joshua prays that God would keep the sun in its place so that they could see God bring them victory, and he did, and he did it. But I want to tell you as we close, some people today would look at a passage like this and they would scoff and they would mock. We're so sophisticated today that we know that we do not live in a geocentrist world, a, a, a universe where the sun goes around the earth. Instead, we live in a heliocentrist world where the earth goes around the sun and they would say, Ha! This proves that God's word can't be true because the sun doesn't move. The earth does. Friend, even knowing these things, don't we still describe the beauty of a sunset today? Because Joshua, from his vantage point, knew that he had prayed, and when he did, looking from his perspective, the sun stood still in the sky. God can make Heaven and earth move for us when his people pray. You know, you would think that the people of Israel would never forget the power of prayer after something like this on this day. But like all of us, they needed a reminder. Many years later in their relationship with God, as Solomon was dedicating the temple, he prayed and God responded. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, the Bible tells us, If my people, who are called by name, will humble themselves and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Believer, I want to tell you this morning, if he can heal a country, he can heal your home. He can bring restoration to whatever you're going through if you will call on his name. All God's waiting for us to do is to humble our hearts and to pray. Would you stand with me this morning? As we prepare for our time of invitation, I just got to tell you, I know that God can still answer prayer and he can still work wonders. Because this thing that he did when he made the sun stand still is nothing compared to the day when he made his son rise from the dead. We can have hope and assurance in the power of prayer in our lives today because of how he rose his son when Jesus lived a perfect life that we could never live. You know, a lot of people think that to tap into the power of prayer, you've got to be a good enough person. You've got to work hard. You've got to do good. All you need to do is to trust in Jesus. To come to the end of yourself and say, I can't do it. I need Jesus who lived for me, who took my place when he paid for my punishment and my wrong at the cross. And he lives, and I want him to live in me. Our instrumentalists are going to begin to pray, but do you need to trust in Jesus today? Is that why he has brought you here today? All you got to do is tell him, I want Jesus. I need Jesus. And he will save you. If you need some help to make that decision,